Wow, that's an awful lot of doomsdays. Like, if you put them all together, I'm pretty sure you get four or five dooms years. The following is an in-depth story analysis. If you haven't seen this film, you might want to before watching this review. The premise behind Superman Batman Apocalypse is basically what if Batman and Superman were surrogate parents together? And man, is that an absolutely fascinating idea. One is the eternal optimist, one the eternal pessimist, and both have very extreme and opposite views on the notion of trust. Superman gives everyone the benefit of the doubt, with the possible exception of Lex Luthor, until he's given a reason not to. And Batman distrusts everyone, even and especially Superman himself probably the most trustworthy person in the universe. There's a lot of merit to both worldviews, of course, but those worldviews are also each hero's greatest weakness. Batman is so paranoid, he doesn't know how to ask for help when he needs it, and people who would otherwise be his allies don't trust him either. Superman is so naive that somebody might have to get killed before he realizes that a person right under his nose was bad news all along. Now imagine those two guys raising a teenage daughter together. Sounds about as stable as The Simpsons. With a bewildered and confused Supergirl trying to understand her place in a strange world, we have a really serious and poignant situation here that might resonate with anyone who's ever suffered a personal loss at a young age. Being an orphan, and after knowing your parents not simply being adopted as a baby like Clark was, losing your home and never being able to return, accepting new parental figures, trying to fit in in an alien environment, and being expected to live up to demanding expectations while you're still trying to figure out who you are and what you want to be. The trouble is, this is a movie whose priorities are out of whack, and those ideas mostly take a backseat to and are primarily used as a loose backdrop for a series of slugfests. Of course, I expect a lot of superheroes and villains hitting each other in a superhero movie, especially in an animated one, but as I always say, action should serve story, not the other way around. And that's doubly true when you're dealing with an internal who am I and where am I going sort of story. This is a coming-of-age story, or maybe it's a story about parents learning to let their children go their own way, and it's so much more concerned with the spectacle than it is focusing on the emotional journey that the meat of the story tastes pretty undercooked to me. The introduction of these themes of adolescence and the responsibility of the mentor have a lot of potential, and sometimes the movie is suddenly really thoughtful about them but it doesn't spend enough time fully realizing its characters beyond their archetypes. And I find myself, by the end of the movie, not totally sure I really understand Batman, Superman, or Supergirl, and why they make some of the big decisions they make. We're told through a news broadcast as the movie opens that Batman broke up a kryptonite asteroid before it could smash into the Earth. I cracked up at Batman was unavailable for comment. Kara zor ship has crashed in Gotham Harbor, and now we have a brand new and, may I say, kind of uninspired and hardly thought out reimagined origin for Supergirl. Her backstory, for one, is incredibly glossed over. At first, it seems we don't have all the facts, but then it's never elaborated upon. Apparently, her parents put her in a ship knowing the planet was going to explode and planned on following her right after, but for some reason, couldn't make it to their ship before the planet went kablooey. Why not just make a ship big enough for the three of them? Unless her father lied to her and they had to make a one-man pod for whatever this version of Jarell's reason was for doing that with kal -El. Who knows? Having Batman discover her is an intriguing idea. Of course, he's going to start asking a lot of questions. Why does she show up now instead of closer to when Clark's ship crashed? Why does she have gaps in her memory? Might one of Superman's enemies be behind her sudden appearance, especially considering she just happens to metabolize sunlight better than Superman does? Supergirl might come to distrust and even resent humanity because of Batman's reaction to her. She's lost her parents, her home, and the first person she meets on this new world her cousin calls home wants to lock her away for as long as he can because he thinks there might be something sinister behind her arrival. The trouble is, none of the things Batman is concerned about are ever explained. They all seem to be just coincidences. The movie begins with a series of questions about the circumstances surrounding her arrival, and it watches like a, uh, what do you call it, a mystery, a mystery Superman refuses to acknowledge. 
Kara is his cousin. There's nothing suspicious about it. Case closed. By the middle of the film, Batman and Wonder Woman have strong-armed Superman and forced the point that she's too dangerous to be allowed to run around Metropolis because she can't control her powers, which she demonstrates in what at the time watches as a striking and potentially even prophetic image when she blasts right through Superman's statue with her heat vision. And Batman tells Superman that ever since Kara arrived, he's let his guard down. He even has a great point where he says they don't know enough about about Kara for him to have revealed his secret identity to her. Through most of the film, it seems like each of them has a point. They're refusing to compromise and work together, and eventually they'll find a way to meet each other in the middle. Instead, Superman, who really has been pretty careless through the whole movie, is proved right by the movie summarily dismissing every question Batman had at the beginning. It just never comments on any of that again, save for one token line about Kara's mother's name. Okay, so she couldn't remember it earlier, and now she can. She's been gaining more of her memory gradually since she crashed. That doesn't prove anything. And her mother's name is Allura. I mean, if Batman's that paranoid, he ought to be analyzing the crap out of the fact that the word Allure is part of Kara's mother's name. But that's apparently good enough for Batman. He smiles, showing that he totally trusts her now. She gets to be a superhero. The end. So Crypto was just freaking out on her for no reason at all? Okay. To be sure, it's strange that Batman isn't just a tick more sympathetic toward Kara, given that they both share the loss of parents, albeit through totally different circumstances. Batman even admits that he can't be sure if she's culpable in whatever evil scheme she might be an unwitting participant in. If that's the case, why does he have to be so cold toward her? I get he's Batman, he's unemotional, he doesn't do sentimental, but he's bordering on all-star Batman and Robin cold here. Besides that, though, the movie throws Batman under the bus hard by just totally ignoring all those completely valid concerns he had about her, and it overly simplifies the ethical issues at the core of the story. You've got a girl with too much power, who doesn't know how to use it, doesn't know what to use it for, is brash, emotional, and just went through an unfathomable traumatic ordeal in losing her entire planet. I mean, give Spock heat vision in that scene in Star Trek 09 right after Vulcan explodes where he's choking Kirk, and just see what happens. Then, add to that the possibility that someone has already gotten to her, and might be using her to nefarious ends and the certainty that someone, Darkseid, plans to. She's a flesh and blood person with innate rights who hasn't, as far as anyone can tell, done anything wrong. Yet it's impractical to expect that just because she deserves to make her own way that letting her do so now, after all the destruction she accidentally causes when she first lands on Earth, is the responsible thing to do. How far to which side do you straddle the line between completely controlling an innocent girl and letting loose a time bomb on the world? That really should have been the crux of the story, where everyone has a point, but no one has an answer. That might have been interesting, although I think still hard to swallow, if by the end it were confirmed for sure that none of the circumstantial evidence of malevolence Batman was concerned about amounted to anything and it was all just coincidence. And if Batman were forced to face the fact that he might have been partially responsible for sending Supergirl on a dark and distrusting path, for setting that example to an impressionable, lost, and confused teenage girl. And it also would have been a lot more compelling if that influence, or even just the conflicting influences of all of Kara's would be parental units in Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman was what sent her into the waiting arms of Darkseid in the first place, rather than her just being kidnapped, brainwashed, and then giving her a throwaway line afterward, questioning whether she was just mind-controlled or if she followed Darkseid because he tapped into a real darkness that was inside her. Maybe he did, but who knows? I don't know enough about her to even want to contemplate the idea of her having a dark streak. There's a token bit of foreshadowing to the dark Supergirl bit when Kara puts on an edgy reveal black dress after the montage of her trying on clothes all over downtown Metropolis, which suggests she has a rebellious side. But really, what teenage kid doesn't? Her dialogue often borders on melodramatic and overly whiny, but overall, I can kind of appreciate where she's coming from. She just wants to be independent and her own person, so naturally she's going against whatever her surrogate parents say. And also, naturally, she's trying to be independent by doing whatever all the normal kids are doing. Because what she really wants, more than anything, is to fit in. While that shopping scene gives her the most obvious and generic teenage interest, I can appreciate why she's trying to embrace all that, and it doesn't really speak to a dark or sinister side. Certainly everyone has a dark side, and it will be really interesting to explore hers after everything she's been through. And also, what better villain to explore that with than a guy named 
dark side. But we're not doing that. It watches like a typical mind control scene. One minute she's scared to death of dark side, and the next she's fighting Superman and saying that dark side cares about her. It's possible Darkseid couldn't have done that to her if she were more strong-willed, more sure of who she was and what she wanted to be, and that Darkseid is the equivalent of a gang or a cult leader who preys on the desperate and vulnerable. But the film, again, is a lot more concerned with big fights with the Furies, which are certainly thrilling, no question, than it is with really thoughtfully exploring Kara's traumatic and treacherous path toward embracing the role of the hero. As is, the mind control stuff seems as pointless to me as the amnesia. When I don't have a sense of who a character is, a story reveals nothing to me about that person with gimmicky plots about her being compromised and forced to act out of character. I realize this is a story about a person who doesn't know who she is yet, and maybe her not being able to control herself in one scene and not having any memories early on are supposed to be allegorical to more concrete, real-life adolescent difficulties. While you're trying to find yourself, you feel like you don't have any control and you're confused about what you stand for and what you believe in. But isn't being a teenager in a new place with new parents and the responsibility of being the most powerful person on the planet with parental figures that are at each other's throat and each represent different things plenty to serve that story? I do like Darkseid's role in this story a lot, but it would fit this material better if you were actually trying to lure Kara to him and make her think it was her idea than this easy mind control plot. But it is interesting that Darkseid is the only wannabe role model that gives Kara a specific path and a goal to work toward. He tells her that if she leads his army, she'll be feared everywhere, and that she'll have power over tons of civilizations. Kara says in Themyscira that she wants everyone to stop deciding what's best for her, that she should be allowed to decide that for herself. But at the same time, of course, she doesn't know what she wants for herself. She says in Metropolis that she wants to be a normal Earth girl, but then she begins to look up the Harbinger, and maybe, though there's not nearly enough discussion about it, she's not sure if that's enough for her either. Learning to control her powers is hard, and what Darkseid is offering is easy. Go nuts! Blast away! Pound away! Kill, kill, kill! Not having to be responsible sounds like freedom, but of course, the price for that kind of freedom is being the instrument of someone else's terror. It could have been very Luke Skywalker at the end of Return of the Jedi. Give in to your hate, and it will set you free. She certainly has plenty to be angry about. Man, what I wouldn't give for an adaptation of some of the early New 52 Supergirl stories after this. The notion that Batman and Superman, with their totally opposite approaches and ideologies, make up exactly one male parent, and Wonder Woman is the level-headed, middle-of-the-road between them that creates a perfect mother to their single father, is great. Batman and Superman are so worked up over their argument with each other that neither is taking smart steps to make sure Kara is safe and that the mortals she comes into contact with are safe around her. Batman wants to keep her locked up instead of helping the trainer to use her powers. If there's something fishy going on, he might more readily find out if he cautiously worked with her, but keeps his eyes and ears open. And Superman wants so much to give her the benefit of the doubt to give her everything he had growing up that he's ignoring that she can't help but be dangerous and stupidly takes her out in Metropolis where everything might go wrong when he really should have taken her to his parents' isolated family farm like he does in the third act right away. It's the perfect place to work on her self-control and maybe under his supervision... A, uh, guidance, not the superpower of supervision, so they don't get injured, his parents would be the great moral influence on her that they were for Clark. Wonder Woman is the only one of them that's level-headed enough to look at what Karen needs, not what she wants or might want. I don't know that I buy that Batman and Superman are both this boneheaded, especially for months at a time, but I do like Wonder Woman's role, and I also like that she's effectively been a parent herself before, and that she's more mature and prepared to help Karen, not just because of some mother instinct, like she's right for this just because she's a woman, but also because she's had experience in helping a lost girl who destroyed everything she touches find a way to control her impulses and lead the life she wants with Barda. The other reason Batman insists on Wonder Woman's plan is because one of the Amazons, Harbinger, has had a vision of Kara's death, or what she thinks is Kara's death. It ends up being her own. At first I found this a little confusing, because they look so much like each other in the face, and they're both blonde with similar hair lengths. I thought at first that Kara was having that vision herself, because we're introduced to Harbinger in a random bedroom with no context at all to where we are or who this is a couple scenes before we actually go to Themyscira and are properly introduced to her. Then it turns out Harbinger caused her own death by telling Wonder Woman about it and her insisting Kara come to train there. 
That's kind of sad because she says that she's a harbinger for everyone but herself, as if she wishes that she could see her own fate, and then it turns out she does, and she dies very shortly afterward. I don't spend enough time with her to really care, except that Kara lost her best friend, and while the question of destiny is somewhat relevant in questioning if Kara must be a hero or a villain because she has these awesome powers, or if she can just lead a normal life as Barda tries to do, it kind of comes off mostly as an unnecessary contrivance to create a more concrete reason to bring Kara to Themyscira than just Wonder Woman's a good influence, which is really good enough. And, of course, to get a nod to Crisis on Infinite Earths in there. This plot point doesn't really do anything to further Kara's character progression or to add anything to Batman or Superman's arcs, except to give Kara one more horrible trauma to deal with, and maybe to vaguely suggest that being special always comes with unforeseen and uncontrollable circumstances. And you simply have to do the best you can and accept that when you have power, bad people are sometimes going to want to exploit it. Harbinger dies because everyone's trying to keep Kara safe, but Darkseid was going to come for her no matter where she was. That's perhaps the point, that instead of trying to protect Kara, her mentor should have spent more time preparing her for the worst. But that's never discussed, and just like all that alleged mystery at the beginning, it's pretty much forgotten about right after it happens. We keep moving from one action scene to another, rather than logically knitting those together with a well-crafted series of choices and consequences. Perhaps my favorite thing in the movie is Barda, the former head of Darkseid's Honor Guard, who defected and was broken out of her conditioning by one Wonder Woman. She lives a seemingly normal, mundane life in the middle of suburban America, free from all the action and carnage of her previous life. She has exactly what Kara said she wanted at the beginning of the movie, and it seems like the movie may be saying that you can have any life you want so long as you work at it. But then, we're immediately back to the power and responsibility message. I like the realism of you can have a normal life, but... Barda has struck a great balance. It turns out she's just like our other three heroes now. She lives two lives. She has a personal life and cherishes that privacy and solitude, but she's ready at a moment's notice to put on a costume and go save the world. Barda didn't strike me as someone who would watch a lot of television. That big screen TV was suspicious to me from the moment Superman and Wonder Woman walked in the room, and I couldn't help but smile when it slides up the wall to reveal her armory. Barda represents what Supergirl will be, the hero who fights because she doesn't want to squander wonder this amazing gift she's been given, but also the Earth Girl, who finds a way to fit in so she can also have something for herself, which of course helps to remind her what she's fighting for in the first place. Kara, unfortunately, sees none of this, because she's on Apocalypse and Bard has been brought in to help rescue her. I wish she and Barda could have some screen time together. I would buy her decision to become a superhero by the end much more if she was following Barda's example and trusting Wonder Woman's guidance more because of it. Another great thematic element that isn't brought far enough to the fore or effectively integrated into the greater narrative. The climax is ridiculous. The fight is all kinds of fun, but nothing that's happening makes any sense. Darkseid has promised not to come after Kara because he gave Batman his word after Batman impressed him by threatening to destroy all of Apocalypse and kill his own friends in the process to get Kara back. Which, by the way, let's address for a second because I don't buy that at all. Partly because it seems really out of character for Batman to be willing to kill a whole planet full of people, not to mention Superman and Wonder Woman with him for any reason at all. I mean, he's usually off stopping mad schemes like that, regardless of what the reasoning is behind them. And maybe he's bluffing, but he proves sufficiently enough to Darkseid's satisfaction that it's not a bluff, and I'm inclined to agree with him. You could say that I'm projecting what I know about Batman from other stories, but this seems out of character for the version we've had in the previous movie, and I don't get the impression that it's trying to do its own darker, more trigger-happy version of Batman. I don't know, maybe it is. I mean, Batman is also the first to kill one of the Doomsdays before it's confirmed that they aren't, as Wonder Woman says, really alive. Superman feels bad for mowing them all down with this heat vision even after everyone seems to have come to that conclusion on their own. But Batman puts a battle axe in one without hesitation before he can be sure that they're not sentient beings. I don't know. That doesn't seem like a thing Batman would do. Anyway, so Darkseid shows up at the end not to try to recruit Kara again but to kill Superman just because he says his death is long overdue. What? First off, I guess Darkseid knows Superman is Clark Kent, because he's waiting for Superman at his parents' house. How does he know Superman is going to go there at that moment? And if he knows Superman and Clark Kent are the same person, why not broadcast that to the world just to make his life harder? And if he can boom tube his way anywhere and thinks he can take Superman single-handedly and another Kryptonian he personally trained and knows is even stronger than Superman is, 
Why in the world hasn't he done this a lot sooner? I mean, I realize that Darkseid usually has these boom tubes and can go anywhere he wants to in any Superman continuity, but I always assumed that he didn't just go off and do this all the time because he didn't think he'd be able to beat Superman. Maybe Darkseid just wants revenge on Superman for taking Kara back, but he doesn't say anything about that. And more than that, why does he wait two whole months to go after Kara the first time around after giving his Furies the order to go get her, but now he shows up like a day or two after he last saw Superman? I'm assuming that. It's hard to tell how much time passes between scenes throughout this movie, and it's awkward because on two occasions, I'm trying to figure out why characters are acting like it's been a long time between scenes, and then suddenly halfway through a scene, someone gives me forced expository dialogue, and it's like, it's been two months, and I'm like, oh, okay, maybe just give us timestamps or something, especially since it happens more than once? Darkseid seems to just be in the mood to tangle with Superman after the bout they just had. It screams lazy plotting. We need a climactic action scene. It seems fitting to have one on the Kent farm where Kara is trying to grow up and mature, but because she's special, the bad guy won't let her, which is a great setting, definitely. So we'll just throw Darkseid in the Kent's house. It's like one of those cling books I had when I was a kid. You know those books where you put your own combination of characters in front of cool settings and imagine them duking it out. I know! Let's put Darkseid in the house! And then Superman gets kicked into space! And then Supergirl smashes Darkseid into the house! I've said this before, but there's been a long history of collateral damage in Superman things before Man of Steel. This one is absolutely nuts! and incidentally breaks some of the same things that get broken in Man of Steel. Why do people in combo movies smash each other into the one building there is when there's acres and acres of empty land around them? I guess it hurts more to get hit into a wall than it does into the ground. No, the real reason is because when you have stuff in a scene, you want the characters to interact with that stuff. Otherwise, it looks like a static environment, right? Okay, sure, but it instantly becomes a mindless action scene when there's no logical reason beyond that for doing things like, say, Superman smashing up his own parents' house and barn. Although, I give Superman a little more of a pass than I do Kara because he's doing that out of a total mindless, out-of-control rage when he thinks Darkseid has killed Supergirl. It's like Angry Superman at the end of the first Christopher Reeve movie. I'd appreciate it a little more, though, if he didn't immediately come right back to normal as soon as he punched Darkseid to a pulp and sees that Kara's okay. He seems like he's trying to kill Darkseid, and in a movie all about discipline and self-control and using power responsibly, there's no talk whatsoever about that. He just turned into what Batman's afraid Kara will be, uncontrolled power unleashed in a brilliant burst of energy. There could have been a discussion about how easy it is, even for the put-together, always-does-the-right-thing Superman to lose control when someone you care about is in danger. But nope! Nothing like that! And then, after almost getting Omega blasted to death by Darkseid, and no idea how he knew that much of his blast wouldn't kill her, and I'm also not sure I buy that it didn't, she decides arbitrarily that now she wants to become a superhero. There are all kinds of believable ways, out of the material we have here, for her to have come to that conclusion. But none of that is really utilized, so it comes off like she just becomes Supergirl because the movie's over and that's supposed to be the resolution of her character arc. This movie is based on another Jeff Loeb Superman Batman story, one I remember no one ever talking about before this was made, and the only reasons I can fathom you would want to adapt it are A, to do a Supergirl thing you can sell on Superman and Batman's names, B, because the word apocalypse sounds dramatic, and C, because Wonder Woman didn't do as well as we'd hoped, and we can only sell movies with Justice League, Batman, or Superman in the title, and we don't want too many of our titles to all sound the same. So we'll do something else under the Superman-Batman umbrella, so that it's not all just Justice League and Batman and Superman. I don't know why the movie is called Apocalypse, at least spelled that way. I mean, we go to Apocalypse, but that place isn't spelled like this, and there's not really an end-of-the-world scenario any more than there always is when Darkseid gets involved. And while I'm complaining about the title, is it Superman slash Batman or Superman and Batman? Why is the title in the opening credits different than the one on the box? They're at odds through a lot of the story, so it makes a little more sense that it would have the slash in it, but it's just odd that it's inconsistent about that. 
This is the first of the DC direct -to video features that seems remotely tied in any way to a previous movie. As far as I can tell, this is supposed to take place in the same version of the DCU Public Enemies was set in. The only thing that connects them story-wise is a news broadcast at the beginning talking about President Lex's impeachment, which of course happened in the previous film. Otherwise, there's not a lot from that movie informing this one. Oddly, though, there are other past events in the comics that do factor into the story, but we're not told much about them, and that's a little awkward. Super Superman is already familiar with Doomsday, as he calls him by name when he, Batman, and the Amazons take on that horde of Doomsdays. That ridiculous, underpowered horde of Doomsdays that apparently Darkseid cloned from the original one, but didn't make them as strong as the original Doomsday, just so he could have this fun fight and it would be easy to beat an army of them. The Doomsdays look suspiciously like the design from Superman Doomsday, but that was a different universe, right? Has Superman died before in this version? Is that why there's that giant bronze statue of him in the park in Metropolis? And incidentally, the exact same statue that's erected for him after his death in the comics, but that for some reason is replaced by a big impersonal black marble superman S in both Superman Doomsday and in the Justice League episode hereafter? This is a minor point, but Bruce Timm did two Death of Superman stories, where he replaces that statue with a far less meaningful and more ominous and depressing one, and now we finally get it in one of Timm's movies, Movies, and it's left entirely ambiguous as to whether or not Superman even died here. We got Doomsday, so I'm going to assume that's what I'm supposed to think. But I find that unnecessarily confusing, and it's not quite playing fair with the audience. The movie plays like a continuation of a continuity we haven't seen much of, as if certain comics count in this world, but we just have to guess which ones. When you make a standalone movie, or even a sequel, it shouldn't matter what else happens in the world those movies are based on. We've started from scratch every time prior to now, and now that we get a sort of sequel to one, that's the movie where what comic lore counts is most ambiguous. I love the way this is handled in Batman Under the Red Hood. That movie includes the backstory for Jason Todd from Death of the Family in an adaptation of another story. But if you're totally unfamiliar with that material, and even if you had no idea who Jason Todd was prior to that, it's completely accessible and a story that stands alone, in a vacuum. If you're going to include Doomsday, it's unfair to assume the audience will know what that is or where it comes from. And it's just as weird for the initiated as the uninitiated. Although, it is an easier pill to swallow if you just assume Doomsday is some much more easily killed monster than he was in Death of Superman, since they're mowed down here about as easily as the multiple Santas that pop up when you expose them to static cling in the tick. It's also got that same problem I've complained about with a lot of these, where the action is more violent than it needs to be, and there's a little out-of-place profanity just there to make it feel a little more mature, when what it really needs is a little more emotional maturity. There's also some adolescent and middle-aged male sexual fantasy fulfillment. The Terminator-esque nude Kara at the beginning, regardless of it being in silhouette, is totally unnecessary. And there's a weird amount of cleavage shots and such. A lot of pandering to the target audience, which is inappropriate for this material. And it strikes me as a movie that on paper should appeal to men and women equally. There's nothing inherently adult about this story, really, and if the theme of growing up was better executed, I think it was much more of a shame that this isn't meant to be seen by kids. There are a lot of disjointed but thought-provoking ideas here that, with retooling, could have all been put together to create a cohesive and compelling coming-of-age story. I like all the voice work. Summer Glau is an inspired choice for Supergirl, and Tim Daly and Kevin Conroy do a lot to elevate often mediocre and sometimes out-of-place dialogue. The animation is fluid, and the action is often spectacular. Hundreds of Doomsdays is a dumb thing to do within the framework of the story, but I can't deny that it looks great. Clearly, the effort went into making a great spectacle, not telling a great story, and I only wish this treatment had been given to a story that made sense to be more action-driven than idea and character-driven, so I could simply enjoy the ride rather than scratching my head through so much of it. I'm going to give Superman Batman Apocalypse a 2 out of 4.